All right, welcome to another edition of Story Time with Uncle Sage. Now, other than just being a fun thing to do, this video is going to be a little different. I was recently accused on my website or on my uh, YouTube page uh, of being a person who's never contributed to society because I don't work. Well, I have worked. I have worked my fingers to the bone. Let me tell you, one hour, this is, this is a scientifically proven fact, that one hour in front of the public eye speaking is like a 40 hour week. And by those standards, I have worked some, hun uh, some uh, 160 hour weeks, some you know, 1600 hour weeks, that I have spent much of my life in front of people, both making music and speaking. So, I would like to share a story with you of how I took a pedophile, a dangerous pedophile, off the street. I have contributed to society in ways that other people won't do. I, instead of draining the well and just continuing to make money and being greedy, I stepped back and utilized the time I had bought myself to help society. I have fed the hungry. I have ministered to the sick and dying. I have cared for the old and mentored the young. I, I have contributed much more to society than a person could that just works all the time. Because you know what? You're not working for society, Robert. You're working for yourself. So here's the story of how I took a pedophile off the street. So I was a youth pastor and I was at one point in charge of a rather large tri-state youth camp and there was a young man who was not a member of my church but one of our sister churches who was a part of the camp and he was an odd duck for one thing he was on his computer all the time he brought his computer with him and he was constantly on his computer he was a, I was impressed at what a computer nerd he was and, and how capable he was of finding uh, ways of getting on the internet even when we were out of range in places where you didn't think there was a way to get on he would figure out a way to get on and he was a quiet guy he kept to himself I couldn't get him to participate in any of the activities and oftentimes he would stay he, he just happened to end up to be in in the cabin that I was in charge of, of uh, being the chaperone for and because he would never leave and I couldn't get him to leave, I oftentimes would have to delegate my duties to other people so that I could stay there or find someone that could stay there and sit with him since they weren't allowed to be alone in the cabins. So um, we kind of got to talking and I tried to crack his shell and I tried to, you know, uh, get him to talk to me and, and get him to open up. And uh, I really didn't have a whole lot. I didn't think I was, I was succeeding at all, but I kept trying anyway. And so, I remember I was had had been to town and bought the hundredth case of sodas and waters to keep the refrigerators in the cabins full, and uh, I was stocking the, one of the refrigerators when he came into the kitchen, and um, he just started talking to me, and and I found it kind of unusual because he'd kind of been avoiding conversation, and he was acting very oddly. He was shaking. He was. His eyes were darting back and forth. Um, he was very nervous. And he just asked if I would pray with him. That he felt like he was demon possessed and that he needed help. Now, I was of the particular type of church who did exorcisms and did deliverances from demons. And there's a saying amongst people who do that kind of weird and gritty work. Uh, deliverance without discipleship is disaster. So I knew that I couldn't just, and I, I believe that that kind of work is a group effort, not something a single person just takes on. So it began to become clear to me that he was in fact demonized. And um, so when his demons started manifesting, and I won't even go into the details, it freaks people out, but let's just say he was acting crazy. <laughs> You know, I said a very powerful prayer over him, and I basically put the demon to sleep until we could get other people involved and, and delve deeper into what this person's problem was. Some of you that don't believe in this would say he was mentally ill. If that's the case, that's what he was. But I do believe that spiritual people, um, whether you believe they're demons behind their mental illness or not, are capable of corralling that madness temporarily 
through the power of their own will or through the power of God, however you want to look at it. So I put this guy on ice with this. And it was late at night, and I decided to wait until the next day to deal with it. And I was not going to let him out of my sight, that's for sure. So the next day, I'm trying to talk to him a little bit and open up to him a little bit, or get him to open up to me, rather. And this is where he starts to confess. Now, I am sworn, or was, I still am, sworn to protect the confessions of people that confess to me. But mainly their identities. I can talk about confessions without giving away identities. <clears throat> so this young man, this 17-year-old boy, tells me that he is a pedophile and that he is sexually attracted to children and that he wants, that his demons want, and he tells me this, you know, that his demons want him to murder and kill children and rape them. Yeah, shocking. I'm trying not to freak out. Honestly, the southerner in me is trying not to grab him by the throat and strangle him, you know. Uh, but I realized that I had to do something. So, like any good priest, I let him continue his confession. Where he talks about how there was a... There, there is a girl that lives next door to him, a four-year-old girl. And how he sits and watches out her win his window while she plays. And how he... Uh, it, the, the only reason that he hasn't... That he hadn't at that point... Uh, kidnapped her, raped, and murdered her was because he was afraid of her angels, that he saw angels around her that were protecting her. Whether this person was insane or demonized, that's a matter of personal opinion. I will say this, he was dangerous and I knew it. I believed him when he said these things. So, I did what I was required to do by law and by morality. I contacted my authority over me, my bishop, <clears throat> we uh, together contacted his parents and his pastor and law enforcement. And this individual then was taken under a doctor's care because he hadn't yet committed a crime. And uh, had uh, he was essentially chemically castrated. This is where they give them a chemical that reduces their ability to engage in any sexual behavior or thoughts. And he was put on some serious drugs, and he was put under a doctor's care. And uh, so, yeah, to uh, Robert, who said, I don't contribute to society, that's just one of many, many times that I have contributed to society. That's the story of the time I took a pedophile off the street and saved who, who knows how many little girls' lives by pushing in, by making myself available, and by dedicating my time to helping other people and being a voice of reason and representing the good in the world. So don't tell me I haven't contributed to society.